Okay, welcome to Ideas at Work and Beyond. I would like to say that today's show is an overview of the United Nations. I believe that if you are watching the show right now, watching the show right now, and you, you know people, friends, family members, please tell them to just go ahead and turn to channel 23 because you're about to get the lesson of your life about the United Nations. I know you've heard about it all week long, and today is very special because we have a very special, intelligent African-American to educate us, give us an overview about the United Nations. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Mr. Jerry Leapart on the show. <laughs> Mr. Leapart. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ivan. It's good to be here as usual. Thank you so much for inviting me and Thank you for that introduction that I can never live up to. <laughs> but uh, I think we have a lot of information to cover uh, okay. tonight, uh, Yvonne, talking about the United Nations. And in the uh, first part of this discussion, what I'd like to do is talk about how the United Nations uh, came to be. And uh, we'll, we'll do this uh, by using um, slides. Uh, basically, everything that um, I'm going to say about the United Nations, uh, our viewers can actually uh, locate uh, much of it for themselves on the um, UN website. And so perhaps we could go to our first slide. Okay. Well, um, you know, while they're doing that, I would like to say thank you very much for, for being here. You, this is not the first time. You're not a stranger to the show. Right. And with your wealth of knowledge, I really appreciate that uh, you're able to be here to give us an overview and to educate us about the United Nations. Okay. okay. Um, I don't know that we uh, got to the first slide yet or, or not. Mm -hmm. um, but in any event, uh, the, the United Nations uh, website is to be found at uh, www.un.org. Uh, and you can sort of go through that and get uh, a very brief uh, history of the United Nations that it started in October uh, of 1945 mm -hmm. with its first session having uh, taken place uh, in San Francisco. And it was developed literally out of the ashes of World War II, where after all of that uh, destruction, uh, people did come to recognize that there has to be a better way of uh, solving uh, disputes between nations. Okay. Um, now, um, if we take a look at the, the next slide, the second slide, it, uh, that, that is from the uh, United Nations uh, website, and it lists uh, just in four paragraphs the, uh, um, the brief overview and history of the United Nations, where in 1945 it started with 50 countries and um, has grown from there over the years to having um, 191 member states. Okay. It's important to recognize that the United Nations is um, an organization primarily for governments. It's, uh, it's not um, an organization for individuals, but rather for, for governments. governments. Okay. okay. And within the United Nations, it has uh, what they call main bodies. Uh, and I think we're looking at, um, no, back to the that third slide, um, go forward to, that's the one, that um, the main bodies of the United Nations, and this is something that uh, people can take with them, it consists of the General Assembly, mm -hmm. the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, the Trusteeship Council, the Secretariat, the International Court of Justice. Those are the six main bodies of the United Nations. Now, Ivan, when uh, we introduced this, um, you know, I uh, thought you were going to mention that a part of the motivation for doing this comes out of the 
extremely important program that you did, I think it was two weeks ago, when uh, Mia Farrow and the yes. uh, principal of the assistant Denver, principal, yes, um, Tom Salem, Tom Salem, yes, uh, came in and gave a very important presentation on the humanitarian crisis taking place in Darfur. Right. And uh, each of them explained how they needed, and the world needed, the United Nations to take a leading role in bringing about a solution to the uh, potential genocide and to the humanitarian crisis taking place there. Uh, Mia Farrell, for her part, kept referring to the need for the United Nations to come in, and she kept mentioning that the Security Council had thus far failed to act. Right. And it was uh, notable that in uh, calling attention to the need for Security Council action, Mia Farrell kept saying that uh, two countries, China and Russia, right. uh, appear to be uh, standing in the way. Now, um, that is, um, that's, that's an interesting way to, to put the issue of Darfur when you are speaking primarily for an American audience. Okay. The primary point that we need to make in this show is that the United Nations has never been an easy organization for the American public to accept. We uh -huh. have a very, uh, you might say, ambivalent viewpoint about the United Nations uh, in this country, and, and, it's, and that's been true for, you know, for quite a long time. Can I ask you why? Well, um, I'll try to answer the question in this way by first okay. giving a little bit more of the uh, background on the United Nations. As I said, it was started in 1945 in the aftermath of World War II. But remember that it, right after World War I, mm -hmm. a similar attempt to establish an international body uh, was made and, and it resulted in the establishment of an organization called the League of Nations. The League of Nations. Now, uh, the United States never joined the League of Nations mm. uh, because the, the United States, the, the point of view that had developed by that time was that it did not want to uh, be involved in any organization where its own sovereignty, its own, uh, you might say, uh, right to act might be challenged in any way by a bunch of foreigners. Ah, I see. <laughs> okay, or people from over there. Okay. Um, that okay. Uh, we'll take care of our affairs right here, thank you very much, and we do not need or want to um, put ourselves in a position where our rights can be interfered with by some international body that we um, know little or nothing about. Uh, I think that's a fair way to, to characterize uh, that, uh, that attitude. Now, uh, seated in, or placed in front of on our table here is, uh, is a recent book on the United Nations, and it's called um, the, uh, the Parliament of Man, and the subtitle is The Past, Present, and Future of the United Nations, okay? But Ivan, I want to tell you that... Can I, can I say something? Sure. Um, before we go to the United Nations, mm -hmm. what was the mission of the League of Nations before the United Nations? Well, the, the, uh, I can tell you that one of the uh, primary sponsors of the League of Nations was a U.S. president, President Woodrow Wilson. Okay. And Woodrow Wilson described World War I as, quote, the war to end all wars, mm -hmm. all right? And in order to um, have a way of making sure that there would be no further war, the League of Nations was basically set up as an organization to help uh, secure um, and assure uh, peace and stability uh, in the world, okay? Um, and it simply did not work. Now, 
I think we're going to have to be mindful of our time. As you okay. know, okay. Ivan, when I you and I uh, have our discussions, uh, time goes by very quickly. Exactly. So um, I don't think we can linger too much mm -hmm. on the League of Nations other than to, again, say that uh, the United States never joined it. Okay. All right. Now, um, I mentioned the title of this uh, new book uh, called uh, The Parliament of Man by uh, Paul Kennedy, the subtitle of which is Past, Present, and Future of the United Nations. It's interesting, uh, Ivan, that that subtitle, Past, Present, and Future of the United Nations, is only for the book um, that is on sale in the U.S. Elsewhere in the world, the book has a different title. Huh. And the title of the book elsewhere in the world is The Parliament of Man, quote, The United Nations and the Quest for World Government, unquote. The Quest for World Government. Huh. The reason why they took that title off of the U.S. version is that the, the concept of world government is a red flag here in the United States. People see that and they'll say, well, whatever it is, we don't want any part of it. <laughs> I'm not going to read the book. <laughs> exactly. And so there, there again, it's a recognition that here in the United States, we've always had sort of a, um, a, a dim view of the idea of, of world government. Now, um, there have been some exceptions. Um, uh, the United Nations happened to come along at a time when the U.S. was led by presidents who um, were very supportive of the idea of the United Nations, and, and that would be uh, President Franklin uh, D. Roosevelt, uh, followed by uh, President Harry Truman. Um, both of those presidents did an awful lot to pave the way for the establishment uh, of the United Nations. Uh, President uh, Roosevelt, in a speech made um, during his time, announced what were called the Four Freedoms. And uh, they, they really took on, all over the world, the idea of the Four Freedoms. And they were uh, freedom of speech, freedom of thought or religion, uh, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. Hmm. And actually, those four freedoms made their way into the beginning language of what is called the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, okay, which was adopted by the United Nations in its early days back in, I think, 1948, okay. after the United Nations had just gotten started. And um, when Harry Truman uh, came into office, he used to carry around in his pocket a little piece of paper, okay. uh, kind of like this. Okay. And on it, it had an excerpt from a poem uh, written by uh, British poet uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. And the, the poem was called Loxley Hall. And the, the, the poem written back in the 1830s had... Uh, the six uh, short paragraphs that stated as follows. For I dipped into the future far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world and all the wonders that would be, saw the heavens fill with commerce, argosies of magic sails, pilots of the purple twilight dropping down with costly bales, heard the heavens fill with shouting and their rain ghost ghastly dew, from the nation's airy navies grappling in the central blue. For long, for long the worldwide whisper of the south wind rushing warm with the standards of the peoples plunging through the thunderstorm. Till the war drum throbbed no longer and the battle flags were furled in the parliament of man, the federation of the world. There the common sense of most shall have hold a fretful realm in awe, and the kindly earth shall slumber, lapped in universal law. Hmm. Uh, uh, as I said, Harry Truman used to read that to uh, senators and congressmen uh, who were opposed to the United Nations. Okay. Now, um, from that... Um, 
I think we can um, go back to our third slide, the one that was called the main bodies. And um, I think I should, um, uh, should just uh, give you a brief overview of, of each one of those bodies. Um, okay. The first one, the, uh, the General Assembly, right. that is the one that is really most like a, a parliament where each country, uh, each member country, now it's one before that, <laughs> the one before that with the main, yeah. There you go. Um, the General Assembly um, is where each country has one representative and they, you know, and they have one vote. Um, the General Assembly meets each year from roughly September to December, and they are meeting now. Now, um, as you know, uh, the, the UN uh, General Assembly session has been making news this week. Exactly. Uh, at the beginning of each General Assembly session, world leaders assemble, and they're all invited to give a talk and to mm -hmm. give their vision for what they uh, would like to see the United Nations accomplish or their vision for what they see as the um, main concerns of the world for, for that year, okay? Now, the, the General Assembly might sound a bit like a parliament of man, uh, but it, it has relatively little power, mm. okay? Um, we go, Next to the Security Council, the, the Security Council is actually the, the body within the United Nations that has the responsibility for peacekeeping, for peace and security, and uh, to, to set aside the nice sounding words, uh, the Security Council is the uh, body within the United Nations that can knock heads or that uh, wields the, uh, the power to intervene and thus can uh, bring on and, and take enforcement measures. And, and actually, when you think of the United Nations, you think of the Security Council. The because security, that's what's been in the news. Right, well, as I said, the General Assembly meets once a year from September to December. Right. And they can meet at other times, but they have to go through a process. Okay. The Security Council uh, is basically always in session. Uh, and if it's not in session, it can be called into session literally at a moment's notice. Okay. okay. Now, the General or the Security Council has 15 members. Okay. It has five permanent members and 10 elected members. The five permanent members are the United States, uh, China, Russia, France, and England. Mm. Okay, <laughs> and these are basically the, the countries that uh, were the victors in World War II. Okay. And their status as permanent members of the Security Council really do arise out of the outcome of World War II. Now, I said there are 10 other members of the Security Council that are called the elected 10, okay. or to use UN shorthand, the, T, uh, the um, E10, okay. whereas the per five permanent members are called the P5. P5. Okay. The elected 10, or E10, are selected for a two-year term, um, so, uh, sort of on a rotating basis, that is, every year, you know, some new member is coming in and some new members are going out, okay? Now, uh, I wanna ask that we skip to, um, let's see, one, two, three slides, and the one that says Article 27 on it. Okay. Now, before, or as we're going to the slide that talks about Article 27, the feature that distinguishes the P5 from the other Security Council members mm -hmm. is that the P5 have veto power. If any one of them uh, can veto any action that the Security Council might take, <laughs> okay? Now, uh, a lot of people have spent, can, you, you can go through the through the entire uh, U, um, UN Charter looking for the word veto, 
and you will be saying to yourself, now, I know those countries have veto power, right. but I, I don't see the word veto anywhere. Where is it? Interesting. Okay. Interesting. So um, Article 27 is very strangely worded, and I, I do hope we can get that up on screen. Um, okay, he said it won't come up. It won't come up. Okay. Uh, it's the uh, fifth slide. All right, okay. Um, the, the language that gives rise to the veto is as follows. I'll quote it. Decisions of the Security Council on all other matters shall be made by an affirmative vote of nine members, including the concurring votes of the permanent members. Oh, okay. That's what it says. Okay. So in other words, if the... Yep. The permanent five do five. not concur, any one of them, then no decision can be made, <laughs> which, of course, <laughs> translates into a veto. a veto. All right? Now, um, going back a little bit into uh, UN history, um, you introduced me as, uh, as an African-American, so um, it behooves me to uh, mention uh, Ralph Bunch. Yes. Okay. By the way, there's a center after him at Howard University. All right. Uh, uh, Ralph Bunch was, I believe, the uh, head of Howard University's um, uh, School of Diplomacy mm -hmm. or its uh, School of uh, Public Policy uh, for a number of years. Okay. Uh, but he then went to the uh, United Nations. Um, actually, he has a, he has a int very interesting background. He uh, worked for a time in the um, Office of Strategic Studies, which was the forerunner to the CIA. Ah. And then he worked <laughs> for the State Department, and then the State Department assigned him to work um, at the United Nations to help get it formed. Okay. He then worked very closely with Eleanor Roosevelt to establish uh, and uh, get adopted the, uh, the International Declaration on Human Rights. Okay. Um, he then, uh, for a time, worked uh, for the UN body called the Trusteeship Council. We kind of skipped over that council, but we'll, we'll come back to it. The Trusteeship Council had as its purpose uh, administering those countries that were um, supervised by other countries. This, it, it's really an outgrowth of the colonial system. Okay. And so you had a number of countries that were um, uh, so-called <laughs> trust countries because they weren't truly independent. Uh, uh, but the countries that had colonized them didn't really want to be seen as being colonial anymore at the time the UN was established. So they, they set up a trusteeship council and those countries, the administration of them, went into the trusteeship council. And it still exists today? Uh, no. The trusteeship okay. council went out, of, uh, went out of business in 1994 when the last country that was under its uh, care became independent. Yes. And that was the country of Palau. Palau. <laughs> that Palau. was the last uh, trusteeship uh, council uh, country. Wow. Now, a lot of work went, uh, was done by the trusteeship council in the 1950s and in the 1960s during the independence movement among the countries in Africa. And that's when you saw a rather large growth of the United Nations as countries that had been colonies became free and independent. And then the, one of the first things they did usually was to apply for membership in the UN, where they would, of course, get a seat on the General Assembly, but forget about the security, <laughs> of course. Wow. Now, wow. <laughs> the, the UN has another body called the uh, Economic and Social Council. Mm -hmm. And that is a very important body, and I'm going to tell you why. 
You have heard of um, non-governmental organizations, right. NGOs, NGOs, yes, um, Red Cross, uh, Red Crescent, um, the um, American Friends Service Committee, uh, Catholic Charities, just uh, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, right. um, Save the Children, which mm -hmm. is actually uh, an NGO located uh, nearby here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just, you know, many others. Now, NGOs are welcome to apply for consultative status with the Economic and Social Council at the UN. Okay. You submit an application and they approve you and then that means you can go to UN functions, go to UN meetings. You don't have a vote on anything because the only ones that vote are the countries. Okay. But it is through the Economic and Social Council that NGOs are allowed to participate in UN functions and UN activities. Nice. Okay. Um, now, the uh, Economic and Social Council um, has a lot of responsibilities in what some people refer to as the soft power of the United Nations, whereas the Security Council deals with the hard power. Right. And no one right. seems to quite know what the General Assembly deals with. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but certainly the um, ECOSOC, Economic and Social Council, provides the vehicle for people to come in uh, through non-governmental organizations. Now, in addition to Ralph Bunch, there's another person that uh, we want to mention, and that's uh, Doug Hammarskjöld. Okay. Doug Hammarskjöld was the second Secretary General of the United Nations, and he took office in 1953 and remained in office until 1961. When Doc Hummerschel uh, became Secretary General, the, uh, the Office of Secretary General had very little authority and no clear direction on what to do. Well, what he did is he set out to determine that uh, he needed uh, to have a large enough staff to get things done, and he was able to hire over 5,000 people Wow. To, uh, through which he could administer the United Nations system and take care of that which had to be taken care of. The other important thing that Doc Hammarskjöld did was to establish the concept that the Secretary General could take action, could do certain things without first getting uh, the approval of either the General Assembly or the Security Council. Uh, that it, His notion was that if there was a crisis in the world and the UN had to be represented and present, then he was gonna go there. Okay. And, okay. and, and do what he could under the, what he called the good offices of the United Nations and then you know, have the, um, the, the main bodies, the Security Council and the General Assembly, you know, give him further direction once he got the ball rolling. Okay. And um, to this day, uh, Doc Hammarskjöld is regarded as perhaps the, um, uh, the, the greatest uh, Secretary General that the United Nations ever had. Correct. Okay. Uh, he died tragically in a plane crash in 1961 in, um, in the Congo which at that time was still known as the Belgium Congo, but it was a part of the uh, struggle for independence in that part of the country. And uh, the, the struggle for independence in the Congo, which then became known as Zaire, which now is known as the Congo again, right, right. Uh, was very intense. And um, uh, I, I'm dating myself a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> but when, I was a, when I was a kid, you know, I, in, in the news would come on, and uh, I would struggle with these names, you know, Dog Hammerschold, and I, I think we, <laughs> we called them, uh, you know, Dog Hammerkill. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't quite, you know, get it right. And then um, within, uh, within the Congo, 
you had um, um, leaders and characters like Moise Tshombe and uh, Patrice Lumumba. And as a child, we had a lot of fun with Patrice Lumumba's name. <laughs> but uh, as it turns out, Patrice Lumumba was um, and is now regarded as a, as a hero, uh, as, um, uh, even though he too was, uh, was killed uh, tragically in circumstances <laughs> that um, but they keep might or off. might not have implicated the United uh, States. He, he had the nerve to say that uh, the people in Congo should be um, in control of their own resources. Yeah, and then he died afterwards, right? But let's stop right here. Okay. We're we, we, we going to take a break because we have the news, and All after right. that we will con continue okay. this um, when we come back, we'll, do with, uh, we'll talk about the current Secretary General, and then we'll switch topics. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you.